January this year for the first time, and so I'm I'm kind of back to yeah. So uh, I was asked to talk about the uh, uh, Wigner distribution function in the context of uh, electron ion collider or the nuclear structure, but I, I thought that the audience is a bit quite broad, has a different background, and may not be very familiar with this kind of physics. So I decided to split my talk into two parts and in the first part I'll give you a very a broader overview of the introduction to the uh, physics of the EAC which is based on my write-up in this uh, this is basically my talk at the Cork matter in last year in Wuhan and the second part of my talk I will give my own research uh, present my own research on the Wigner distribution function so uh, let me uh, start with uh, the introduction uh, so the electron ion collider, that's the main uh, thing. So this is basically the future uh, high luminosity polarized EP and EA collider at Brookhaven National Laboratory, uh, which is dedicated to the study of the nucleon and nuclear structure. And by future, I mean the first collision will be like uh, 10 years from now. So, so it's like uh, so they started to build a detector. You have to first build the detectors and collider and then it takes 10 years and by um, by high luminosity i mean this 10 to the 34 in this units and if this number uh, doesn't ring a bell then you can simply uh, remember that this is thousand times higher than the luminosity of the hera which is the previous uh, ep right and there's a very recent it was very recently decided that the brookhaven national lab uh, we host this uh, electron ion collider, EHC, and that's, that decision was made in January this year, which was a big uh, exercise. So we, there was a big excitement in the lab. And the idea is basically to uh, use the existing tunnel for the heavy ion right now and add the electron ring and to, to the EP and EA collider. And here's, uh, uh, here's a white paper which was published in, in 2012. So, um, in fact, the EIC is not the only future DAS machine, but there are a couple of uh, this is uh, there is the EIC in the US 10 years from now, but there's also a pro project that's been a proposal to do the EP and the EA experiment in China. So, there is a Chinese version of the EIC that will take, I think they are writing a white paper right now. And there are also a proposals at the LHC, which there are several options like uh, FCCEH or something called very high energy EP collider. And uh, so there, uh, and these are very complementary with each other, starting from uh, EHC in the US, which is a medium energy, medium to high energy machine. And the EHC in China is a much lower energy. So they are very much complementary in terms of energy. And there is a ultra high uh, energy experiment at the CERN uh, LHC. So uh, that means that uh, we are probably approaching the era of precision QCD and precision study of the nuclear and nuclear structure in the next uh, 20 to 30 years. So that there is uh, exciting. So this seems to be the uh, direction that the nuclear physics community in the world is heading to. So let me uh, uh, remind you the basic facts or basic kinematics of EHC. So this is a, a electron and proton collision. It's electron energy between five to 18 GeV. And the proton energy is like 40 to 210 GeV. So the center of mass energy is, is, is like 140 GeV. And the target can be a proton, or it can be also a deuteron and helium, gold, any nucleus of your choice. And this target can be polarized. So yes, she's a world fast polarized EP collider. And there are two uh, most important kinematical variables to remember. One is Q square, which is the virtuality of the photon. And this is, this is basically the resolution. This, uh, this sets the resolution scales when you probe the pro proton or the nucleus in the target. And there is also a Birkin variable X, which is uh, basically the fraction of the proton momentum carried by the fraction, um, um, carried by the quarks and gluons. 
Now, uh, ESG is a very uh, unique machine in the sense that it can uh, significantly broaden the uh, fate space uh, that can be explored in this experiment. So if you look at this table, this is a polarized uh, DIS and also the nuclear DIS where the target is the nucleus. And you can see that the fate space is extended by two orders of magnitude, both in X and Q squares. So in that sense, this is an unprecedented uh, experiment and there's a tremendous physics opportunities associated with this. So uh, let me briefly, very briefly, uh, uh, go, uh, walk you through uh, the main scientific goals of Yeshi, which I summarized in three uh, pillars. And I will walk you through uh, each of these uh, topics uh, one by one. So let me uh, start with the uh, uh, tomography. So the tomography is uh, basically a technique to see inside an object without cutting it, like in this uh, CT, for the computer tomography, or the, basically you want to see the uh, multi-dimensional image of the object that you're interested in. And of course, the object of our interest is the nucleon and the nucleus. And so we want to see how the patterns and quarks and gluons are distributed inside the proton and nucleus. Now, the speaking of the distribution, there is, of course, there is uh, this pattern distribution function for the PDF, which is basically the light cone uh, separated correlation function. So for this is a u quark pattern distribution function, um, which basically tells you the number distribution of up quarks with momentum fraction x inside a uh, proton. Uh, this PDF can be uh, is defined for each flavors and also the gluons. And the important thing is that the cross section can be factorized uh, in terms of pattern distribution function and the short distance uh, pattern, pattern uh, cross section sigma zero. And the cross section is given, given by the convolution of these uh, PDFs. And the, and the good things about this PDF is that you can extract it from, from several experiments and use it to predict the calculate cross section for other uh, processes. So that's the universality of PDF basically saying that the same function can be used for different processes and that is fundamental to the uh, predictive power of the PQCD. And there's been a lot of things that have been known already for this PDF. But from our viewpoint, we are not satisfied with that alone because we know that so, uh, from our viewpoint, PDF is, just, is a one dimensional uh, uh, imaging of the proton, whereas basically only the by one dimension, I mean the longitudinal momentum distribution, but we know that patterns are distributed in the impact parameter space B with two dimensional vector B perp, and also the patterns as a transverse momentum K perp. So the nucleon is much more complicated because and you can add this extra dependence on K perp and the D perp, and then you can uh, generalize the notion of the PDF to include the dependencies on these uh, new vectors. So starting from the PDF, you can add the k perp dependence, then, 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 then you get something called the transverse momentum dependent distribution, and that is the TMD, and that gives you a three-dimensional tomography of the nucleon and the nucleus. Or you can add the BPOP dependence, the impact parameter position dependence on this uh, distribution, then you get something like a generalized pattern distribution with the TPD. It also gives you a three-dimensional tomography. Or you can even add both B and K, then you, then you get Wigner distribution function. That's the ultimate uh, PDF. We contains all the information about single pattern distribution in the nucleus. And this Wigner distribution function is the topic of my second part of this talk. So let me first give, uh, give you a, a brief, quickly go through the uh, TMD and GPD. Just one question, quick question. Yeah. Uh, so I can think of B perp and K perp as conjugate moment, uh, conjugate variables right. to each other. Uh, well, not not exactly, <laughs> but you can actually define simultaneously. Okay. Well, it's the same as in the Wigner distribution in quantum mechanics. You can define in the phase space distribution function, and uh, you can define it anyway, and you can measure it anyway. <laughs> Okay. It's the same story as in the uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so TMD is 
So uh, TMD is, uh, as I said, it's a K-pop dependence and it is useful to describe uh, processes uh, when you measure the uh, pattern in the, the process momentum of part in the final state. So instead of include, doing inclusive DIS, you can uh, detect one uh, particular species of hadron, let's say pi plus, and measure the PPRP distribution with respect to the beam. And with this PPRP, it's small, then there is a uh, QCD factorization theorem called the TMD factorization, which is proven to all order in perturbation theory, which tells you that the cross section given, is given by uh, the convolution of uh, TMD PDF and also the TMD version of the fragmentation function and has a part. Now this basically opens up a new class of observable where uh, perturbative QCD is applicable. Now uh, behind this uh, very intuitive formula, there is actually enormous uh, complication hidden uh, in this equation. And just to say to, the, to say the least, uh, this PDF depends on two scales. And mu and xi, we know that P, usual PDF depends only on one scale. There is a, a renormalization group equation, but TMD satisfies two uh, renormalization scales because there are two scales. And one is the uh, ordinary uh, RG equation, and the, the other is the something called the Colin Sofa equation. And there's been uh, lots of uh, recent progress about this evolution, in, well, maybe not. not not recent anymore, but this uh, anomalous dimension and splitting function has been computed to uh, three loops. And there has been a proposal to calculate this anomalous dimension in the large QCD. That was a very interesting development. So all this suggests is that uh, TMD physics is becoming uh, precision physics. Uh, nowadays, uh, people started to doing the global analysis of TMD, which is a very uh, remarkable, uh, including very high precision data. But, so, but compared to the ordinary global analysis of uh, ordinary collinear PDF, of course, the number of data points are pretty much limited. So it's, I would say it's still it's in infancy, but I would expect that this field really uh, fully blossoms in the Yeshi era. So there's uh, lots of activities about the team these days. Now I uh, switch to the, the other uh, three-dimensional distribution function, that is the GPD, the generalized pattern distribution function, uh, which is defined as the known forward uh, matrix element of this. So the initial state and the final state momentum are different. And this difference is this delta. So this uh, PDF uh, depends on this momentum transfer delta here. And, and once you take the Fourier transform of this delta to the, uh, you can go from delta to B perp, which is a two dimensional Fourier transform, then you can get uh, the, uh, so you can, that tells you the, how the patterns are distributed in the impact parameter space. And there is a, a nice uh, uh, visualization of this uh, B perp uh, dependence as a function of X, the spread of the patterns are more and more spread if you go to the small X region. And we can even extract these functions uh, by using in experiments using the deeply uh, virtual computer scattering in here. The, uh, the basic uh, the GPD is uh, the so-called nuclear gravitational form factor, so, uh, uh, which is basically, uh, yeah. So this is probably a similar question to what she asked. Is there a relation between the Fourier transform of the TMD and the GPD? Uh, no. No, actually not. <laughs> it's a, there is no relation. No. So, so here I, I here I define the uh, Fourier transform with respect to K prop, but this conjugate variable R has nothing to do with the B prop. It's a different okay. kind of Fourier transform. So it's a it's a it's a different variable. So there's not really a uncertainty principle. You can specify both variables simultaneously. Oh, it's it's Shoman. Right? Yeah. yeah. Hi, hi, Sean. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right, so, uh, so I was talking about the gravitational form factor, which is basically the matrix element of the uh, QCD energy momentum tensor, and um, basically tells you uh, how the proton uh, couples to the graviton. Of course, you cannot measure this directly because the gravitational interaction is too weak, but you can indirectly measure it from the DBCS experiment. And all this, so there are four uh, form factors, A and B and D and C bar, 
and all these uh, are very interesting. A and B are interesting from the viewpoint of the so-called GSUM rule, uh, which tells you the decomposition of the proton spin in terms of uh, uh, quark and gluon angular momentum. And there has been a lot of excitement about this D term in the last few years, which is related to the pressure distributions inside a, a proton. And that means that, uh, so there has been a very uh, uh, influential paper by this JLab experimentalist where they uh, first extracted this D term form factor from, factor from the experiments. And the Fourier transform of this D term form factor has a physical interpretation as the pressure distribution function. And here is the pressure inside the proton as a function of R, the radial coordinate from the center of the proton. And if you are close to the core of the proton, there is a repulsive core force. Uh, that is, uh, that is uh, the force which uh, uh, prevents the proton from collapse, collapsing. And if you go to the large R region, there is a negative pressure, which is basically the confining pressure. It's a force to try to confine the proton. And uh, so there's been a lot of excitement. And uh, more, uh, more int uh, fundamentally, this D term form factor is actually a conserved charge of the nucleon, just like mass and spin. Right? So this is, and we don't know this value. So there is a conserved global charge of the proton. So that's why I call it, uh, that's why people call it the last global unknown. It's a fundamental constant of a proton, which we don't know at all at the moment. That can be extracted from experiment at the Well, JLab did this uh, fast extraction, but uh, there's a lot of problem in this extraction. And I, and I believe that the only way to uh, realistically, reliably extract this parameter is a Yeshi. So that's an interesting topic. All right, so uh, let me move on to the second topic uh, that is uh, gluon saturation. And probably uh, many of you already heard of this if you are. Uh, interest in heavy ion physics and the uh, gluon saturation is a very important phenomenon. And this has to do with the uh, QCD at small x. Where, uh, so this is a plot of the proton distribution function that I showed you pre before, but I didn't uh, uh, mention that this red band, which is a number of gluons, which is exploding as we go to the small x region. So this is the number of gluons divided by 10 uh, just in order to fit in this uh, figure. So there is an explosion of the number of gluons as you go to the small X region. And we of course know why this happens, because if you just compute the probability to emit the soft gluon in one loop perturbation theory, then it diverges like uh, one over X. So it diverges, goes to infinite when X goes to zero. And uh, this growth has been predicted actually based on this uh, one loop and also the resummation by the BFKL. And so if you go to small X region, the proton wave function is fully packed by uh, gluons. But of course, this growth cannot continue forever because it will violate the unitarity. And at some point, the number of gluons eventually saturates and because of self-interaction and eventually uh, form the uh, universal QCD matter at high energy, it's called the color glass condensate. So the idea has been run, around for quite a long time, like 40, almost 40 years by now. But uh, the theory of the saturation phenomena is, uh, is the color glass condensate. So this cartoon, this is uh, uh, often used uh, cartoon, that if you go to the small X region at fixed Q square, then the proton wave function, the proton is becomes dense and more dense. And at some point, there is a threshold beyond which the number of gluons saturating. And in this saturation uh, domain, there is a character, it's characterized by the one momentum scale. It's called the saturation momentum, which is an increasing function of decreasing X. And if, if X is sufficiently small or the energy is sufficiently high, then this scale becomes perturbative and you can calculate the cross section in this regime. And of course, there has been lots of uh, uh, discussion and uh, there's a uh, disc uh, of uh, whether this saturation phenomena has been found in previous experiments like in Hera and Rick and then Ed Chi. And he, the, here's some uh, example of the signatures of uh, saturation that has been uh, uh, put forward where you can explain the data quite 
nicely using this based on the saturation pictures. But of course, there are always people which come up with the alternative explanation and uh, without the saturation has been observed, this kind of discussion never ends. So this is why we need an electron ion collider because uh, we know that electron heavy ion collision is uh, best but the ideal place to study saturation. And that is because there is no uh, initial stage interaction uh, because one of the projectiles is a lepton, so which doesn't interact strongly. And that is the advantage of our LHC and RIC. Uh, there is a, a nuclear enhancement of the saturation momentum. So this QS scales like uh, A to the one third. So if you go to if A is 200, then A, so there is a six times the enhancement of the saturation momentum. And that is the advantage of a HERA. So here, here's the estimate of QS. So, if, so actually at HERA, the Q saturation momentum is less than uh, GEV, but uh, at EAC, it's expected to be uh, larger than uh, uh, 1 GEV. And that's very interesting because the energy of HERA is higher than the energy of the EAC, but nevertheless, the saturation momentum is higher at EAC because of this uh, enhancement factor. So this uh, yes is a really uh, interesting place to discuss the situation. So I'm not going to go through uh, various predictions for this. And jump on to the next uh, topic, which is uh, uh, nuclear spin. So the last uh, pillar is uh, nuclear spin uh, physics. The spin physics is uh, uh, basically trying to understand how the spin of the proton is distributed uh, by the into the uh, spins and the orbital angular momentum of quark and gluon. So uh, so we start, there are two basic observations. Uh, the proton has spin one half, and the proton is not an elementary particle. Uh, from starting from these two facts, uh, one can immediate, immediately conclude that spin of the proton, which is one half, can be decomposed into the quark helicity and the gluons helicity and the orbital angular momentum of quarks and gluons. And in the naive quark model, if you believe in the quark model, then the spin of the proton is 100% carried by the helicity of the quark, so delta sigma is one, the rest is zero. So that's the naive uh, expectation, which is not so, uh, so, and one can actually measure this delta sigma from experiments. If you do the polarized uh, DIS, and this is a uh, double uh, spin asymmetry of the proton and mu, proton and electri electrons are both uh, longitudinally polarized and then take the cr asymmetry of the cross section, and from this asymmetry, you can extract this uh, delta sigma uh, from experiment. And here is the uh, first, very first result, which is announced in 1987, and uh, that's by the EMC collaborations at CERN. And the, uh, the, their result was a shock, uh, which basically they say that delta sigma is 0.1 instead of one, and including this error, but it is even consistent with zero. So that was a surprise, and uh, this is where the spin physics started, basically. Uh, so, uh, in fact, this original very uh, fast extraction quite underestimated the delta sigma. More recent value is like 25 or 30 percent. Delta sigma is 30 uh, percent. That's the most uh, recent value, but it's still uh, significantly less than one. So the puzzle continues. And this is uh, basically the motivation of the RIC uh, spin program. And after more than 10 years of measurement, uh, people finally came up with uh, uh, a concrete number about the screw and helicity contribution. And, and there are at least three uh, uh, collaborations, the global analysis uh, P, uh, collaboration, all uh, reported a non-zero value for this delta G. Uh, but you can see this is, of course, the, uh, you have to integrate from zero to one in X, but uh, of course there is a lower uh, limit because the energy is limited and uh, there is a big uncertainty from this unmeasured uh, small X region. So you can see this is uh, uncertainty from the large X region in the horizontal direction and uh, this vertical direction is uncertainty from the small X region. And you can see this uncertainty is uh, big, actually one, basically. We are talking about the decomposition of one half, but uh, the uncertainty is one. So basically we don't know <laughs> the value of delta G. And that's why we need an electron ion collider. 
because we can go to the even smaller X region, and uh, yeah, she and pin uh, down this uh, contribution. So uh, probably, uh, yes, yeah, she can will be able to uh, pin down uh, the value of delta G, the green heist contribution. But uh, that's actually not the end of the story because we know that there must be the uh, orbit angular momentum. And especially at small x, that's a very important contribution. So we expect from a theoretical uh, reason that there will be a cancellation between the helicity and the orbit angular momentum if you go to the small x region. So this is um, our result for which we saw the one loop degrad equation. We can see the almost perfect cancellation between the helicity and the orbit angular momentum. And also there is a work by Azumita and her collaborator where they observed that if you sum the helicity and orbital angular momentum, and if you go to the small x region, it goes to zero. So there will be a cancellation between, so there will be a lot of, there must be a finite angular momentum. And the very important question is whether one can measure it at the ESG. So that's, uh, I think it's an important question to be addressed at the ESG. So the last so topic the, of, uh, yes. The y-axis was what, percent? This is 20%, 10% or what? Uh, this is uh, this is delta G. It's a distribution. Now these it's numbers. Twenty. These are what? Uh, this is a gluon hash distribution. The value of distribution. Uh, I'm just plotting delta G of x as a function of x. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. So this is a dimensional number. Is this is okay. I'm just plotting PDF. All right. All right. So, uh, okay. So, uh, so, th all right. So, so this spin decomposition is about the longitudinal uh, uh, polarization where the spin of the proton is the same as the spin of the nucleus. But we can also polarize the spin of the proton perpendicularly to the direction of motion. Then there is a, this uh, very interesting phenomenon called the single spin asymmetry, where uh, the observation that uh, if you collide this trans transversely polarized proton, into an uh, unpolarized target. And if you count the number of, part, uh, number of particles produced on your left-hand side and the right-hand side, and they are different. And that is called the single spin asymmetry, which is uh, quite actually a, a 20 or 30% effect. It's a huge asymmetry, and that's actually a 40 years old puzzle in QCD. And there has been several mechanisms uh, has been proposed. And, uh, but uh, I would expect that the ESG will uh, be able to nail down the origin of this large single spin. So that's, uh, that's a very uh, quick overview of the important uh, scientific goals of the ESG. And so the conclusion at this point is that of the first part is that uh, I just repeat that in 10 years from now, the experiment, experiment will be running in the US and in China and maybe also in the Europe at soon. But that's, uh, that's uncertain, but uh, optimistically, there will be a DI experiment worldwide. Uh, this is a tremendous physics opportunities for theory and experiment, and, and also the large QCD. I had no time to uh, talk about the large QCD, but there's been lots of uh, discussion, excite, uh, exciting results from large QCD in relation to the nuclear uh, structures. So we have an uh, exciting time ahead. All right, so uh, that's uh, that's the end of the, my first part. Which, and if there's uh, questions, I can take it now. Uh, if not, I can go to the uh, second part, which I expect to be shorter than the uh, first part. But um, that's a uh, weakness for the GTMD uh, distribution function at the ESG. So. Uh, I brief, already briefly mentioned the Wigner distribution function and that as a phase space uh, distribution function uh, with, that's, uh, that gives you a five dimensional tomography. That's five because you have X and two dimensional vector K perp and two dimensional vector B perp. So that's five dimensional. And here is the definition of the Wigner distribution function. Uh, you have uh, this no forward matrix element. The initial and the final states are uh, different, momentum are different. And there is a K-pop, there's a separation in the transverse direction. And thus the K-pop is conjugate to the separation. And this uh, distribution is often called the model distribution function because 
because if you integrate successively over the B pulp and K pulp, then you can reproduce all the lower dimensional uh, distribution functions like TMD and GPD and PDF and everything. So basically, in principle, this distribution contains all the information about the single pattern uh, distribution inside the proton. So that's fundamentally important quantities. And there are several variants for this uh, Wigner distribution function because because already in quantum mechanics, we know that Wigner distribution is a not only a phase space distribution function. There are actually several phase space, phase space distribution function, even though Wigner distribution is by far the most famous one. And there's actually a, a something called the Fushimi distribution function. And that is, basically, uh, that is basically obtained from the Wigner distribution function by Gaussian smearing in K perp and B perp. And the good thing is that the Fushimi distribution is positive definite, whereas in the Wigner distribution function is not positive, so you cannot interpret as a probability distribution function. So here's the example of the uh, Wigner and the Fushimi distribution fun function for the harmonic oscillator in one dimension. So this is a fourth I, exciting uh, yeah. I have a small question here. So yeah. if you go from the Wigner distribution to the Fushimi distribution, you have you have some uh, smearing kernel, right? Yeah, yes, it's a Gaussian. So, okay, and uh, shouldn't the width of that kernel or some such thing appear in the Hushimi distribution? Yes, yes, uh, yes. So the width, the width of the Gaussian. So there is an implicit dependence on the uh, width of the. Uh, so you have Gaussian. not exhibited that. Uh, yes, there that is. There is a slight dependence on this. Uh, well, it, it, yes, there is a dependence on the uh, width of the. But interesting, important thing is that the width in K perp and the width in D perp has to be uh, inverse to each other. So that's an important constraint, but otherwise it's arbitrary. And does uh, physics, uh, well, physics can't depend on that, but uh, the distribution could depend. On that or well, not? it can depend on the width. Yes, it's like a squeeze. It's like in the squeeze state. It's like a squeezing parameter of the squeeze state. Okay, thanks. Any, anyway, so so this uh, Fushimi this the good thing is that the Fushimi distribution is positive definite. So you can see this Wigner distribution oscillates violently if you go to the higher excited state of the harmonic oscillator, but uh, if you Gaussian smear this distribution, then, then you get something uh, positive, definite distribution, which is localized around the classical trajectory of the phase space. So that's one variation. And well, well, you can also go to the uh, fully conjugate space. Instead of having uh, talking about the B pop, you have a, a delta pop, which is a momentum transfer, basically. And that is called the generalized TMD or GTMD. And that is actually more, uh, if you want to measure this distribution from experiments, and GTMD is more uh, directly re related to observable, whereas uh, you, you have to do a Fourier transform if you want to extract the Wigner distribution. So that's, that's an additional step. So GTMD D is more uh, directly related to uh, observables. Now, uh, for me, the most important uh, uh, things about the Wigner distribution function and it is its connection to the orbital angular momentum. So uh, you might know that it's it's quite tricky to define the orbital angular momentum in quantum field theory, the gauge theory, like in QCD. But so uh, that has been settled. But well, there's a lot of issue about the uniqueness and the uh, gauge invariance, and it, it's a tricky business. But uh, it's a nice, a very nice thing about this Wigner distribution function is that you can define the orbital angular momentum in this way. It's a very intuitive way, which is basically the cross product of B pop and K pop. That's the classical definition of the orbital angular momentum, uh, weighted by this uh, Wigner distribution function. So that's actually the gauge invariant proper way to define the uh, orbital angular momentum in QCD. Now, uh, very uh, nevertheless, there's an inter interesting twist, and actually this. Uh, 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 Orbital angular momentum depends on the way you choose uh, the uh, the path of the Wilson lines that is involved in the definition of the Wilson lines. So, so as I said, uh, 
the Wigner distribution function is a non-local collision function along the light cone, but also there is a separation in the BPAP direction. So the question is how you go from here to there by uh, connecting uh, the Wigner lines. So if you go along this light cone infinity and then come back, if you take this staple shaped uh, with some line, then what you get is the so-called jaffe manhua orbital angular momentum. But uh, if you go from here to there, oh, by, by the way, you, do you see my uh, pointer? Do you see my cursor? Yes, yeah, we can see. Oh, okay, okay, good. <laughs> so if you go from here to there by a straight line, then what you get is the so-called G, Shandong G's uh, orbital angular momentum, and they are different. And we can actually measure this difference in Lattice QCD. So this is a fast calculation by Michael Engelhardt, where they find this. So this x-axis is the length of this Wilson line along this uh, z direction, the light cone direction. So zero means uh, if you, means you take the straight line right here, and uh, infinity is uh, you take this uh, staple shaped uh, uh, line, Wilson lines, and you see the difference. There is a difference between the two definition of the orbital ob angular moment, momentum, and that corresponds to the different decomposition, different way of decomposing the nuclear spin, and that is under control, which is uh, which is controlled by the uh, choice of the Wilson line. All right, uh, another uh, interesting aspect of this uh, Wigner distribution function is that you can define the entropy associated with it. So if you open the uh, textbook of uh, kinetic theory and the statistical physics, if you have a phase space distribution function, then you can define the entropy. That's a basic uh, fact. And since we have a phase space distribution function, we can define the entropy here. And we can do that for QCD as a function. Of, you can even define it as a function of x of the pattern, which basically tells you the how complex how complex the proton wave function is as a function of small x. And if you go to the small x region, you see the explosion of gluon number, and you would expect that the entropy increases also. And here is a calculation that uh, the entropy goes uh, diverges like one by x to some power. Yeah, it's basically proportional to the saturation momentum squared. And there is a, a very interesting connection to the jet physics to the entropy of jets in the final state by the stuff here and its collaborator. And that's a uh, interesting development. Uh, so uh, so yeah. this statement that the semi distribution is positive uh, definite that uh, depends on the smearing radius. Right, so it, there is an implicit, yes, but you cannot take the Wigner distribution function here because it takes a log. Yeah, I understand, uh, yeah. Okay, so, but, but so I have to take the- For it to be positive definite, uh, there should be some restriction on the smearing radius or something, right? Well, uh, well, there will be a, a small uh, dependence on the, which I, I just take, the, uh, take it to a physical, typical scale of the problem. But uh, yes, there is a dependence, yes. Okay. So, how much is this dependence on this uh, smearing uh, function, Fusini distribution? Does it depend too much on the width of the Gaussian? I think we studied that in our paper, but I don't remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because the, the entropy defined in this way will also depend on that uh, smearing. Yes, that's right. That's right. And uh, there are actually, there are several. Well, different people have different definition of entropy, like this Christoph Kutak and Kofner and Lublinsky. They each of them have a different definition, and also Dima Kazeev has a different definition. <laughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. okay. But parametrically, at least, I agree. I, we agree with uh, these previous definitions. Okay. All right. So that's one aspect of the beginner, and. Uh, so uh, as I repeatedly emphasized that uh, something is interesting if you go to the small x region, and you can, if you go to small x region, there are lots of gluons, so it's interesting to talk about phase space distribution function. And in fact, if you go to the small x region, there is this uh, enormous simplification also in terms of theory, and that is because you can connect the Wigner distribution function to something uh, known uh, quite well known in the literature that is called the dipole rest matrix. So if you start from uh, this definition of the Grun uh, with the distribution function, 
and we have approximate this exponential factor to be one. So there is x dependence here. So since x is small, then it, this exponential factor is just one. Then after this approximation, then the Wigner distribution function is proportional to the so-called dipole S matrix, which is the correlation function of the Wilson lines along the light cone direction. And since this guy satisfies the, the so-called balitsky kovchikov equation, you can calculate it in the small x region. So at least you can study the small x evolution of this Wigner distribution function. An interesting thing is that there is a, a, this Wigner distribution function depends on the angle uh, between k and b because these are two dimensional vectors. So there is a one angle between them. And we would expect that this Wigner distribution function depends, has this cosine 2 phi uh, dependence uh, on this uh, uh, angle between k and b. And we call it the elliptic part of the Wigner distribution function. And we can actually compute this uh, the angular uh, symmetric part and angular dependent part of the Wigner distribution function by solving this uh, balitsky kovchikov equation, which is an equation satisfied by the Wigner distribution function on the small x. And I plot it as a function of k and b. And you see this peak characteristic peak here. And that is the location of the saturation momentum. Uh, which is depending on the B impact parameter. So the saturation momentum depends on the uh, impact parameter. And if you go to the uh, higher energy with the larger rapidity, you see this peak moves to the right. And that means that uh, the saturation momentum increases as you go to the small x region here. But the interesting thing is that this angular dependent part, the elliptic part, there is no, uh, so this po the position of the peak does not change. And, uh, we kind of understand. Yeah, we kind of understand that, but uh, that's an interesting observation. All right. So uh, the next topic is: uh, Can we uh, measure this uh, Wigner distribution function or the GTMD in experiments? So that's basically the main. <laughs> that that's the title of my <laughs> seminar. All right. So uh, that's that's very difficult, or well, to say the least because we can, as I said, it's a five-dimensional distribution. So there are many variables. And if you want to measure the distribution with many variables, then you have to have more uh, exclusive processes, right? And at least the process has to be a diffractive, meaning that the proton goes to the proton. So the proton uh, scatters elastically. This, and this momentum transfer delta is the delta dependence of the Wigner distribution function. So, so you have to require that the proton scatters elastically here. On top of that, you have to measure at least two particles or two jets in the final state. And that is because the, the relative momentum between these two particles is sensitive to the K-pop dependence of the Wigner distribution function. So here, uh, Here's an example, like in digest production in DIS, this one we can uh, study at EAC, or you can also do this PP collision where you produce a double uh, quarkonium production. That's a very, that's a very difficult process. It's a double quarkonium, but nevertheless, well, the point is that you have to detect two particles in the final state, and it's very exclusive uh, process. And since we are talking about the ESG, let's talk about this uh, diffractive digest that can be measured at ESG. So that's, this is the process where the virtual photon splits into the QQ bar pair. And uh, eventually the QQ bar pair is detected in the final state as two jets. And we define this delta, that's the momentum transfer of the proton, which is uh, equal to the sum of the, sum of the two jets by momentum conservation. And also there's some the relative momentum of the two jets, K2 minus K1, that is relative uh, capital P prop, and that is sensitive to the GTM, the K prop dependence of GP, GTMD. So here's the formula for the cross section, which is uh, differential, uh, in, in which is differential in both in their prop and P prop. And that is, uh, uh, it's given by the convolution of uh, GTMD and uh, somehow the corner. And by studying this P purple and delta pop dependence, you can reconstruct this um, GTMD from the experimental data. That's the idea. 
And so we put forward this idea uh, a couple of years ago, and our colleagues in the, uh, the Brookhaven uh, took it seriously, and uh, they did the first reali realistic uh, calculation of the cross-section uh, using the BPAP dependent solution of the GMOC equation. That's actually very non-trivial. <laughs> Uh, you, you might know that the GMOC equation, to solve the GMOC equation with the BPOP dependence, that's very non-trivial, but that can be done. So this is a very uh, a recent development, and they use this recent uh, techniques to compute this uh, uh, distribution function, and also this target cross-section. So uh, there is a, a nice prediction of this cross-section. Also, they can measure the B2, which is caused by this elliptic, elliptic part of the, uh, the cosine two phi modulation between this relative angles, which is like 1% or 2% effect. And, uh, and this is based on the leading, uh, leading order formula, but it can also uh, go to the higher order. It's the uh, next leading order. That's a very, there's an uh, impressive work by Renaud Sari, his uh, postdoc at the Brookhaven and his collaborators. Uh, they did the complete next leading order calculation of this target cross section, um, but that's that's very uh, complicated, and they're still working on the numerics. They haven't done the numerics yet because the formula is very much complicated. But uh, but it's a matter of time that they will do come up with the numerical estimate. So that's very important calculation. But uh, maybe this one loop calculation is not enough because sometimes you have to do the resummation. And that's uh, that's the work we did. So, so as I said, this uh, uh, this sum of the two jet momentum k1 per plus k2, which I call q perp, is equal in magnitude but opposite in sign with to the this uh, recoil of momentum of the proton just by momentum conservation. So, to leading order, this cross section in q perp is the same. As a cross section in delta part, that's uh, that's obvious kind of. But if you go to the higher order, then you have to define a jet by using the cone around this this uh, leading particles, and there will be an emission of gluons outside this cone, so that will modify the transverse momentum of this guy. So this relation between Q prop and delta prop is uh, uh, broken by this amount extra uh, emission of the gluon out outside the core, and that has been to be taken into account. So, so this relation, which is valid at the leading order, will be modified if you go to the higher order, uh, uh, higher case, and that you need a resummation or the all order resummation of the soft gluon radiation outside the core, jet cone. And we did this, and here is the result uh, for the uh, realistic, realistic Yeshi kinematics. You see this. Uh, uh, I think this is the, the solid block is the original cross section, the leading order. But if you go to the high, uh, do the resummation, you see this uh, 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 this dotted and dashed curves uh, the, after the resummation, the cross section. And you also see that this is the black line is the original uh, B2, but after the resummation, you see the, uh, the it's completely washed out. So um, that is because this uh, Q prop sum uh, of the Yoshikaka, yeah. is yeah. it QT resummation, Q prop resummation? What kind of resummation? It's a resummation of this soft gluon emitted outside the cones. Uh, because that, that will modify the Q prop dependence. Okay. 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 So okay. so the message here is that you should so to leading order Q prop and their prop are the same, but if you go to the higher order then Q pop is not a well defined. This is not a well defined. Uh, uh, the sum of the two jet transverse momentum is not a well. It's not a good quantity because this that's very sensitive to the uh, soft gluon radiation. So you shouldn't look at the Q pop dependence, but instead you have to look at the delta pop dependence because that is less affected. And so 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 the message is that you really have to measure this recording proton and its transverse momentum. Um, that can be done at the ESG. At HERA, they cannot do it, but at the ESG, they can do it. All right, so let me come to the very uh, last uh, topic. I, I skipped this. So there, there, there's also a connection. There's also a proposal to measure the orbital angular momentum 
using this connection between the uh, connection to the wisdom distribution function, but uh, that but I, I skip that and come to the last very last topic, which is the Shiva's function and its connection to the GTMD. So uh, Shiva's function is uh, TMD, the transverse momentum distribution, and which is spin dependent. So if this proton is uh, transversely polarized, and if you count the number of the k pop distribution of this transversely polarized proton, you see this ordinary uh, spin independent TMD, and there is a spin dependent part. And that this coefficient is called the Shiva's function. And that is, uh, so this characteristic correlation between the spin and the transverse momentum, and that is one of the uh, origins of the single spin asymmetry. As I said, uh, as you I just remind you that single spin asymmetry is a left-right asymmetry of the produced hadron in this, uh, this experiment. And uh, the EAC, the gluon shivas function, so, this, uh, so there's, most, peop most people uh, talk about the quark shivas function, but we can also, there, one can also define the gluon shivas function and you can actually measure it at the EAC. And actually, as Meter, uh, she has been working on this uh, gluon shivas function and its signature at the EAC. Well, she, she gave a seminar to the last, last week about this. All right, so let me uh, look at the Shiva's function from a uh, somewhat different uh, viewpoint. So here's a definition I show you again. And this, uh, this is, there is a cross product between transfer spin and the transfer momentum. And this is how people remember this uh, definition. But, uh, but, uh, but this is actually, PDF is a proton matter experiment and the proton is spin one half particle. So, uh, Ideally, you should you should express this correlation in terms of uh, nuclear spinners, which is the U of P. And so 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 S cross K, you can write it as uh, 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 sigma mu nu sandwiched by nuclear spinners. So this is a more proper way to write the defined Shiva's function, right? But once you write it in this way, then you can uh, easily generalize this. So the initial momentum and the final momentum doesn't have to be the same. And also the initial spin and the final state doesn't have to be the same. So you can generalize this to the non forward direction. Then the TMD becomes a GTMD, um, which I call the F12. And the, the, basically the forward limit of this F12 is the Shiva's function. That's the generalization. So you can understand the Shiva's function as a limit of the GTMD. But you, once you write it in this way, then you notice something very interesting because this spinner product is non-vanishing not only for the transversely polarized proton, but it's also non-vanishing if spin is longitudinally polarized, but there is a spin flip. So if there is a, a spin flip, the initial spin and the final spin are opposite, then this spinner product is non-vanishing as a non-vanishing matrix element. And that means that if you measure the spin flip processes, then you can access the Shiva's function. And it doesn't have to be a, a polarized experiment. So here's a, a, a recent uh, calculation that the Yeshi with the pi zero production in deep inner six scattering, where the proton recoils elastically, and there is a rapidity gap, and there is an exclusive production of pion in the final state. And this is an unpolarized cross-section. So proton and lepton are not polarized. This is completely unpolarized uh, cross-section, but which means that you sum over the, all the possible spin configurations. So the initial, you sum over the initial proton spin and the final proton spin. And you automatically sum over the process where the nuclear spin flips. And there, this Shiva's function uh, enters the game. And it turns out that this particular process, the leading contribution to the process in the forward limit is completely dominated by the Siwas function. So this is a very unusual proposal that the unpolarized cross section is dominated by the Siwas function. This is a novel, an entirely different way of measuring, accessing the gluon Siwas function at the EIC. So is this the entire contribution? There's no contribution from unpolarized TMD here? Uh, not in this limit. So we take the forward limit. So, so this is almost a forward scattering. P and P prime are the same. Uh, basically, yes. 
So, so, so momentum transfer is very small. And S and S prime are opposite. No, it is unpolarized. They are summed over. Yeah, it's summed over, but only the uh, helicity flip process contributes contributes to this process. Okay. So that's an unusual <laughs> that's an unusual finding. And there is actually an interesting yeah. connection to the Orderon here. I don't know if you have ever heard of uh, it goes called the Orderon. That's a uh, that's actually a regia, uh, the object defined in the regia theory. It's predicted in the 70s as a C odd counterpart of the polynomial excitation. And there has been a decades of order and searches all in vain, but uh, it's a very elusive object. But there has been a recent announcement at the LHC by the totem collaboration, but that they finally find evidence of the order on, at the LHC. And here's some a new set right. And there is actually an interesting connection between the order on, and this process because. Because if you look at this process, then you can see that the initial incoming photon is she odd, and pi on the final in the final state is she even. So what's exchanged in the T channel must be she odd, and that is the other. Right? So in fact, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between this uh, grun shivas function and the other one, and that is the observation first made by Jan Tso in 2013. And that's actually the, uh, so I think this is a new connection between ESG and LHG. And uh, you can even talk about the gluon schwarz function in PP collision. So, so at LHG, of course, there is no polarization. LHG is an unpolarized experiment, but nevertheless, so if you collide the P proton and proton, unpo completely unpolarized, and you sum over the initial and the final proton spin, and there is a contribution from the uh, proton helicity flip process. So if you measure this, if, uh, sorry. What if you take you don't sum over the transverse spin of the proton? That's the process that I was discussing in my talk last week. Uh, mm -hmm. I still don't think you will get the contribution from order on there, right? You get the contribution from order on only when you are summing over the initial and final spin of the proton. Uh, you are talking about the J psi production, right? Yes, uh, but in even if case, you talk the order about order the order even if you have Jepshai here instead of Pion, mm -hmm. then uh, there is no order on. Yeah, there is no order on. Yeah, okay. Yes. So, so we, we chose Pion because uh, in order to make the make it shield. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so, so interesting thing is that even in LHC where there is no polarized beam, the LHC is just a, com a completely unpolarized experiment. But uh, and polarized mean that you sum over the initial and the final proton helicity. And there is a contribution from the helicity flip processes, and that is uh, dominated by the order. So if you uh, measure this uh, elastic uh, differential cross section, the sigma dt, then there is a usual contribution from the row parameter. It's so basically the real to imaginary ratio of the elastic scattering amplitude. And there is a contribution from the uh, gluon schwarz function. So there is, you can actually. Uh, Maybe you can measure the uh, Shiva's function order on at LHC. That's, uh, that's an interesting connection. So uh, let me uh, conclude. Uh, it's the second part, conclusion of the second part. So uh, my uh, main message is that let's get five dimensional. So there's been lots of work done for TMD and GPD, but uh, 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 distribution is e has even richer uh, information than TMD and GPD combined. And uh, so it can be measurable in EP, especially. And uh, there is an interesting connection to the orbital angular momentum. I think this is the only way to measure the orbital angular momentum of proton. But nevertheless, having said that, we need uh, more foundational works in terms of PhD factorization and the proper definition of the Wigner distribution function. But I think that's a worth pursuing uh, direction of research. So uh, thank you very much, that's all. Uh, thanks, uh, Yoshitaka. Uh, I guess if there are uh, some quick questions, just uh, try to get them uh, first. And then if there are any technical discussions that you want to have, maybe we'll uh, go for them after that. Uh, so are there any quick questions? Uh, yeah, I, I, one, okay. one quick question from me. Okay. Uh, um, so to measure the order on, you wanted 
a single pion observed in the final yes. uh, state, right? That's it. Yeah. yeah. Single pion uh, plus and a proton. And a proton. Oh. Single pion uh, and a okay. proton. So it's an exclu yeah, it's completely exclusive. Yes. Pi and proton. Yeah, that's right. Okay, Ashmita has a question. Uh, yes, uh, I have a doubt about the discussion of the orbital angular momentum. Could you please go to that slide where you uh, talk about the two different gauge link, one staple and one straight line, one defines Jaffe Manohar and one G? Yeah. Yes, I wanted to ask this question since some time. So these are not the only two possible gauge links, right? You can join these two points by any kind of straight line, like you can go uh, somewhere know. here and then somewhere there and then somewhere and then come back here. Yeah. That depends on your process. Okay. So there uh, will be many, uh, many, many, many definitions of uh, orbital angular momentum. These uh, are not, 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 not really. Uh, okay. like, like I said, it's a, it's a good question. So, uh, of course, you want to go from this point to that point, right? Yeah. And of course, you can go this way or you can go that way, you can go that way or you can go that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't matter. You always get the G's definition of OM. Okay. I, I see. So it doesn't matter the direction of this, uh, whether well, this line. Well, it doesn't matter you, whether you go this way or that way or this way or whatever. You always get the G, Shandong G's definition of OM. So the except, special point about except, so, okay, let, let me finish. So, yeah. so you, you get, so it doesn't matter except when you go along the light cone. Hmm. And come back, and okay. only in this case you get Jaffe Manohar OM. Well, you, you can go to the past infinity. Right? Uh -huh. You can go to the future infinity or past infinity. It doesn't matter. Okay. You get the same OM. That that can be shown. But uh, okay. so 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 if you go to the light cone, you get Jaffe Manohar, and if any other path, you get the I see. So what is special about this light cone? Because you are going actually to light cone infinity and there's a transverse gauge link at light cone infinity. That's what right, right. the difference? Well, yes, I, uh, that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, light cone infinity, uh, uh, it, it's hard to explain. I see maybe but, that uh, can be taken as a technical question because okay, that's a bit you. longer. Uh, so let me just ask well, if it is a quicker, indeed technical. If there's any quicker question before that. Uh, uh, okay, so then I think we can uh, start the more technical discussion. Uh, yeah, so then you can... Uh, actually, I had one quick question though. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, uh, it was about this uh, D uh, that you, the gravitational form factor D that you had introduced. Uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, exactly this one. So uh, yeah, you said that uh, this is a conserved charge of the nucleon. Uh, yeah. Can it be measured on the lattice or is it some sort of a light cone quantity yeah. which cannot be measured? It is measurable. Uh, okay. It has to be measured. Oh, I and see. There, is no, uh, there is no difficulty in principle to measure this D term form factor, uh, which is uh, defined this way, because, because this is a completely local operator, gauge invariant local operator. So there is no light cone here. Hmm. And this is a known forward metric element of local gauge invariant operator. So it's straight, it should be straightforward to measure it. And, uh, and actually, uh, there has been a recent work by uh, Detmold and uh, Shanahan. And I think there is uh, even earlier work by Hagler and uh, his collaborators. This is straightforward to measure, I think. Okay. I think in this EIC meeting in January, we'll get more uh, talked a bit about it. Yeah, no, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, no, I remember. now I remember, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, yeah, then I think Ashmita can ask her question now. Uh, yeah, I already asked, so Yoshitaka was answering, so. Yeah, yeah so. Yeah, that's. 
yeah so so this light cone infinity the contribution from light cone infinity plays the different role here right what makes this staple like gauge link along light cone different from any other gauge link on this plane um well, <laughs> that that's uh, that's so jaffe manoha om is basically the pattern picture right yeah. so th this is a jaffe manoha decomposition yeah which is more in line with the pattern yeah interpretation yeah i in my mm -hmm. understanding the shandong so shandong chi has a different way of decomposing it yeah but uh, it doesn't have an interpretation patonic interpretation yeah. mm -hmm. but the jaffe manoha decomposition does have a patonic interpretation mm -hmm. and that is of course related to the, the choice of this light cone gauge link mm. Because light cone direction is a direction which patterns move. Yes, it has a partonic interpretation. Yes. Right. right. Okay, I can understand in this way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I guess the more straightforward question is uh, I mean, is it easy to see why all other uh, uh, connections are, uh, give the same thing? Well, I, I I basically took that statement from this paper by Shandon and and uh -huh. They say that. Oh, <laughs> and my see. understanding is that so uh, eventually, uh, when, when you calculate this uh, Wigner distribution function, so this this is a non-local object, right? Mm -hmm. And the, at the end of the day, you integrate over b perp and k perp. So basically, uh, at the end of the day, these two points merges into other. So when you integrate over the transverse direction, then these two points merge. Uh -huh. So so it, it doesn't matter uh, whether you have you go like this or well, well at the end of the day you, these two points merge. So it doesn't matter how you connect these two points, but only along this light cone uh, there are some remnant effect. I see. Uh, and also, I, 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 uh, so you said that so, so this lattice calculation somehow shows that the two definitions are identical. What what, what does this plot show? This angle hurt. Yes. So uh, so this is a calculation by Michael Engelhardt. Yeah. And uh, uh, I don't think he doesn't. So so of course this is a light cone distribution, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to calculate on the lattice. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And um, nowadays there is a large momentum effective theory where you, which allows you to calculate the PDF on the lattice, but uh, but he's not using it, uh -huh. in my understanding. And uh, what what he's doing is that uh, so instead of this light cone direction, he he has a z direction. So here's a Wilson line in the z direction, and this x axis the length of this Wilson line in the z direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he has some parameter zeta here, and and uh, this is a parameter which. So uh, if this zeta is infinite, that's a light cone distribution function. Uh -huh. So ideally, this zeta is infinite, okay. but he uses this point three, which uh, I, well, I don't know the technical details, but this is a parameter which control controls. How you, how you are close to the how close you are to the light cone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess this number is not large enough. But th anyway, this is a first attempt, and uh, he, his approach is this. Uh, my impression is it's uh, distinct from the large momentum effect theory, where he doesn't do any matching or etc. And also, yeah, he, he takes this ratio, so some, some renormalization factors cancel us out. Uh, okay, but like qualitatively, I mean, what what does this plot? Uh, uh, what what uh, what are you inferring from this plot? Well, the point is that the, uh, depending on the path, whether you take the straight path or the light cone infinity path, the orbital angular momentum is different. Mm -hmm. You see this, so this point is, so this is normalized by the G's definition of orbital angular momentum. And you see this Jaffe Manoha is this one, this corresponds to the infinite light cone. It's very different line. is the conclusion. 
Yeah, so, so, so you see this difference is caused by this closed Wilson loop okay. along the light cone. Okay, okay. So, so, two, so there are two different uh, orbital angular, angular momentum and two different decomposition of the nucleon spin. And uh, so this is a demonstration that the orbital angular momentum is uh, numerically different. I see, okay, okay. Because of the difference in the path of the Wilson line. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, and I had one quick question. So uh, uh, this went a bit fast for me. So when you looked at this exclusive pion production uh, to infer uh, the uh, spin flip, you're using the fact that each single pion production inter induces a spin flip in the nucleon. Th that's the key idea? Uh, yes, and that is the only contribution okay. uh, in in this forward limit. So when in the limit of this proton is uh, uh, in the limit of zero momentum transfer, mm -hmm. the only surviving process is the one in which the proton helicity flips. Yeah. Okay. So that's the only contribution that that's we are able to show that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, uh, thanks a lot for okay, the talk. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, okay. thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, see you somewhere. Then take care. <laughs> see you. Bye. Bye. Bye.